My grandfather would tell me stories of how he spent the latter part of World War II at a school for boys in Canada. As a pilot for the Luftwaffe, he had been captured in Britain when his fighter plane was downed in a failed bombing run. The Allies were worried about where to hold captured prisoners. England was too close to the theater of war. Canada became the best option. Winston Churchill asked Canada to accept over 7,000 initial POWs, with several thousands to follow. My grandfather was part of the initial shipment of troops, going to one of 40 POW camps spread across Canada. He was used to being in a plane, not a boat. The long journey across the Atlantic was hard. Still, it allowed him time to bond with his fellow prisoners. Where were they going? How would they be treated? How long until Germany won the war and brought them home? When they arrived at their destination, my grandfather was stunned. Could this green and lush farmland really be their prison? They were led into Camp 30, down tree-lined roads and past many well-maintained buildings. The Canadians guarding them were older World War I veterans. Looking around at the young German soldiers and officers, my grandfather was convinced they could overtake the Canadians. Soon enough, however, he learned that the Canadians were smart. They given the POWs autonomy within Camp 30, the former school for delinquent boys. Each division of the German army had their own house and reporting structure. The generals even had their own staff. Not only that, they had farmland. Ten acres to keep cows, sheep, pigs, chickens, goats, as well as grow all manner of fruits and vegetables. Looking into the ruined mess hall, I recall stories of the meals. Breakfast was eggs and bacon with strawberries, freshly baked bread, tea and coffee. Lunch, a hearty lamb stew with tomato juice. For dinner, prime rib au jus, baked potatoes and freshly picked asparagus. Some of the prisoners had never eaten this well, including at home in Germany. Even the Canadians were jealous. The fresh fruit was also used to brew high-quality liquors and beer, served to the senior officers and generals. Walking past the football field, I imagine my grandfather and his fellow prisoners forming teams and playing until the weather stopped them. There was an auditorium, and amongst them the prisoners had assembled a troupe that would perform weekly plays. They were allowed instruments so that they could end each Saturday night with a concert. POWs playing the popular big band songs of the day. Glancing into the broken pool, I can see my grandfather swimming, regularly competing against the other services. He was taught English by professors brought in from the University of Toronto. Many of the prisoners earned degrees, some even getting medical doctorates. In the summer, they were allowed to go unguarded down to Lake Ontario to swim and sunbathe. But only if they gave their word of honor, their Ehrenwort, to return. They always did, but still they were German and being held against their will. They dreamed of rescue by U-Boote coming to meet them in Lake Ontario. There were escape attempts, of course. Tunnels, nighttime sprints. One prisoner even made it all the way back to Germany. At the end of the war, none of that mattered. Prisoners were returned to the UK to be gradually repatriated to Germany. I've heard some of the other men at the prisoner camp are making plans, talking with the guards. They talk about how, when the war ends, They'd like to buy land here, move their families from Germany. Many of my grandfather's friends returned to Canada, having nothing left at home. He was one of the lucky ones who still had family alive. As I walk down the same roads in Camp 30 as my grandfather, my footsteps are his footsteps. His stories seem closer, more real. The past is still here.